Alright guys, I tried really hard to wait until the election was over to write and upload this because I knew all of us were going to be glued to our phones to try and figure out what the hell is going on. So let's talk about anything but the election. Let's talk about everything in October. What a month. Seems like our phones were blowing up from political ads, but what about stuff blowing up in actual space? Let's start at the beginning of the month with the most exciting news. The new toilet to the ISS was launched and delivered. A Northrop Grumman Antares rocket lit up the night sky on October 3rd alongside a nearly full moon as it launched on the Cygnus NG-14 mission to the space station. Guys, it arrived on the 5th. And remember, this is a $23 million toilet for the future use on stations and by future crews on missions to the moon. This is the kind of news that I personally have been looking for. A new spacesuit is testing its new trendy fashion, and that new spacesuit is called the Exploratory Extravehicular Mobile Unit, X-E-M-U. This spacesuit needs to protect astronauts from the harsh environments on the lunar surface, which is much more different than recent astronauts have been used to. The suit has had some holdups in the development because of the Orion capsule, but it did keep on going on slowly but surely. So on October 1st, George Neald, who was previously the Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation at the FAA, outlined the agency's plan to build five XEMU suits in the initial batch. I love how they're talking about spacesuits the same way they would talk about muffins. One batch. One batch is almost done and should be complete in December, and the second will be built for qualified testing, and the third will be tested in orbit on the ISS. The final two suits of the set will walk on the moon in 2024 on Artemis III. The Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to three astronauts for their work involving one of the most difficult things to understand. Black holes. Roger Penrose of the University of Oxford in the UK received half of the prize for, quote, the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity, while Andrea Gies of UCLA and Reinhard Genzel of the University of Bonn and the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Germany jointly shared the other half for the, quote, discovery of a supermassive compact object in the center of our universe. This was announced on October 6th. Way to go, guys. Maybe one day you can explain it to me. I hate reporting this, so um, I'm just gonna do it this way. I'm just gonna list out when SpaceX launched and how many satellites, because I feel like it's in every Newsflash. On October 6th, they launched 60 satellites. And then on October 18th, they launched another 60 new Starlink satellites. On October 22nd, SpaceX called off the launch carrying another, guess how many? 60 satellites due to technical difficulties with the camera on the rocket second stage. Then on October 24th, they launched another successful fleet of satellites, making it the second mission in a week. By the way, that was its 100th successful mission. Way to go, SpaceX. You guys remember the James Webb Telescope. It has taken a big step forward in the anticipated 2021 launch because it passed the environmental testing, yay! Which is a series of trials designed to stimulate the considerable rigors of launch. Bill Ox, or Oaches, I don't know. NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland said, quote, environmental testing demonstrated Webb's ability to survive the rocket ride to space, which is the most violent portion of its trip to orbit approximately a million miles from Earth. Yay, let's go, James Webb. It's only been a very long time. I love when people put family first. Chris Ferguson, the commander of NASA's final space shuttle mission in 2011, will not command the first crewed flight of Boeing's Starliner spacecraft in 2021. He was citing personal reasons. He will be replaced by the commander's seat by NASA's astronaut Butch Wilmore, who has been training as a backup alongside Ferguson and fellow crewmates for over two years. Do you all remember when Starman, the literal man in a Tesla in the back of a, you know, just a rocket, went to space in 2018? Well, the Starman just made its cruise by Mars. SpaceX had just announced via Twitter on October 7th that Starman, last seen leaving Earth, Earth made its first close approach with Mars today. Within a 0.05 astronomical units, or around 5 million miles, of the red planet. The fake astronaut, Vaxtronaut, 
Can I coin that term? Will eventually barrel into either Venus or Earth, likely within the next few tens of millions of years. So they determined that by a 2018 orbit modeling study. But fear not, the chance of Earth or Venus impact in the next million years are just 6% and 2.5% respectively. So we're fine. And if we can get through 2020, I'm confident that Starman can get through anything, including crashing into Venus. All right, the UAE has joined the guest list of nations trying to attend the moon party. Scheduled for 2024, this announcement was made while the nation's first mission beyond Earth orbit, aka the Mars spacecraft called HOPE, was making its way to Mars. That mission is a science-minded endeavor meant to study how Mars's climates and atmosphere work from orbit. The new lunar mission is of a different flavor, focused more on developing technologies and evaluating concerns before crewed and longer duration exploration missions leave Earth and land on other worlds. Yay, I wanna go to this moon party. It sounds amazing. Oh. Blue Origin had a win this month. It successfully launched its new Shepard rocket on a uncrewed test flight over West Texas on October 13th. The mission was called NS-13 and was the seventh consecutive set lights of this particular rocket booster and the 13th flight for the Blue Origin's new Shepard program. Honestly, I applaud them for even trying anything with 13 in the title in 2020. I would just skip that number and move on personally, but no one asked me about anything. Two Russians and an American launched the ISS and boy, it was fire. <laughs> But really, American astronaut Kate Rubens of NASA and two cosmonauts lifted off Earth on a Soyuz MS-17 spacecraft on Wednesday, October 14th, and earned a new title of a record-breaking speed flight to the orbital lap. Quick side note, they actually launched on Kate's birthday, so that was um, in, an important part. But basically, it takes about six hours for the Soyuz spacecraft to chase down the ISS, and it must complete about four orbits around the Earth. However, this mission made it in only two orbits, making it the first crewed Soyuz spacecraft to try the fast track rendezvous method. Anywho, they'll be spending about six months working on the ISS as members of Expedition 64. Michael Lopez Allegria, a member of NASA's astronaut corps for 20 years, plans to lead the first fully private mission to the ISS, making history as the first former NASA astronaut to return to the orbital complex. By the way, this guy's a total badass. When he retired from NASA, he had spent nearly 258 days in space, including an American record of more than 67 hours on 10 spacewalks. Anywho, in 2017, he joined Axiom Space, a private space service company that holds the first agreement with NASA to attach commercial modules to the ISS as a precursor to Axiom's own space station. But before all that, they're planning a series of private missions to the orbital lab, working with lots of clients, such as, you may have heard of them, Tom cruise the first launch is planned for october 2021 man there is a lot going on in october of 2021 nasa awarded 370 million dollars in quote tipping point end quote contracts designed to aid its push to get astronauts to the moon and then to mars the funding is spread across 15 contracts to 14 different countries including shocking spacex then Astrobiotic, Lockheed Martin, United Launch Alliance, and the Intuitive Machines. Nearly 70% of the money is allocated to the management of cryogenic fluids such as liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. SpaceX will get 53 million, okay, SpaceX, for an in-space demonstration that will transfer 11 tons of liquid oxygen between tanks on one of its next-gen Starship vehicles. If it all works, it will allow rockets and spacecrafts to fill their fuel tanks in orbit and other off-Earth locations, which is necessary for the establishment of a long-term sustainable human presence on and around the moon. The whole idea of the tipping point contract was to spur potentially transformative technologies and get them to the edge. So many of you guys may know Alan Stern. We're actually Facebook friends, and I'm super excited to tell this story so my friend, well, Facebook friend, Alan Stern, who leads NASA's New Horizon mission, was selected to fly aboard Spaceship Two, Virgin Galactic Suborbital Space Plane. He was chosen via NASA's Flight Opportunities Program to conduct agency-funded research on the future flight, which has not been scheduled yet. The two-pilot, six-passenger Spaceship Two is hauled aloft a carried plane called White Knight Two, which drops the space plane at an altitude of about 50,000 feet. Spaceship Two then fires up its rocket motor and makes its way to suborbital space. By the way, more than 600 customers have booked the seat on Spaceship Two for a small price of $250,000. 
dollars. But I would recommend going the way that Alan Stern did. Just apply for it, get selected. Way to go, Alan. Earth had its hottest September on record, literally all over the world. Countries experiencing higher than average temps, but then Northern Siberia, Middle Earth, that's supposed to say Middle East. Australia and parts of South America experienced unusually high temps. Both January and May have also broken temperature records this year, which then leads to more intense events like wildfires in California. Guys, global warming is real. Over Thanksgiving, please try and convince your cousin who doesn't believe in it. Okay, thanks. It's not shocking that Elon wants to start building a permanent human settlement on Mars as soon as possible. The small company, SpaceX, is on track to launch its first crewed mission of its massive Starship rocket to Mars in as little as four years. Elon said, quote, I think we have a flighting chance of making that second Mars transfer window. The window is of course referred to as a launch opportunity that arises every 26 months for missions to Mars. So we shall see. I hope you get it, Elon, I really do. If you're like me, you know you're going to go to space, right? You don't know how, but here's some big news. Being an astronaut of the 2020s will be completely different than it was for any other astronaut that came before. Based on lots of different factors, this meaning different rubrics. The first generation of astronauts that tested out orbital missions and moon landings in the 1960s were largely drawn from military test flights. While scientist astronauts began participating in Apollo, Skylab, and space shuttle missions in the 1970s and 1980s. Since then, we have most recently seen scientists and military trained astronauts in space. Although the requirements continue to change over the decades, we're entering a new realm where you don't have to be a professional astronaut to fly in space. It's the era of democratizing that access. Lopez Alegria said, it's very difficult right now because the seats are few and as a result, they're quite expensive to go. But I'm quite confident that these prices will come down just like in 1920s and 1930s. Commercial aviation was only something that was reachable by the very, very wealthy. I'm coming for you, space. I'm coming for you. I'm not gonna do a story about this because I've already covered it, but guys, Christina Koch just reflected on a one year anniversary of the all woman spacewalk. Can you believe that? It feels like we just talked about it yesterday. Guys, for the first time ever, a NASA probe has performed a sample snagging operation on an asteroid in deep space. OSIRIS REx, OSIRIS REx, I like that better. Spacecraft went down on the surface of a newer Earth asteroid named Bennu on October 20th to grab materials that mission team members hoped harbor clues about the solar system early days and the rise of life on Earth. The goal was to collect at least 60 grams at first from the surface, but it could take 10 days to determine if it actually achieved this. The point of contact lasted just six seconds. During this encounter, it could have crashed straight into Bennu, detected a problem and waved itself off or touched the surface, but then hit a big rock that made snatching smaller particles impossible. Any of these scenarios could have spelled the failure for the $800 million sample return mission, but it didn't. This amazing first for NASA demonstrates how an incredible team from across country came together and persevered through incredible challenges to expand the boundaries of knowledge, NASA Administrator Jim Bryden said, Stein said in a statement after the touchdown. Our industry, academic, and international partners have made it possible to hold a piece of the most ancient solar system in our hands. But then the 10 days were over and the sample was substantial. It bagged up its precious samples and returned to Earth like me at a buffet. Hey, let's get the to-go's, Mom. They're actually having more samples than they planned on. It collected so much materials on October 20th that the sampling head couldn't close properly. Its head's mylar flap was flapping. Oh, what a good boy, Cyrus. Big news, for the first time ever, science identified water on the moon's sunlit surface. They also found that water is more common on the moon than previously thought, which pockets of ice hiding in shadowy regions of internal darkness. A little dramatic if you ask me. So we've been finding signs of water on the moon since 2008, and in 2018, we confirmed the presence of water ice on the lunar surface. But now researchers in two different studies have detected water at one of the largest crater formations on a sunlit surface on the moon, and also found that the lunar surface could be harboring plentiful patches of secret ice and cold traps, regions of permanently shadowed spots on the moon. That's so exciting. Remember NASA's Mars rover Perseverance? Well guys, it's halfway to its destination. The Mars 2020 rover, which launched on 
July 30th, has now traveled 146 million miles in deep space. Halfway there, keep on swimming, keep on... That's not even the... The, the right tune. While I don't think there will be cake, especially since most of us are working from home, it's still a pretty neat milestone. Julie King is a mission navigator at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California said, way to go, way to go. I'll keep you guys updated on that. The New Zealand company Rocket Lab launched with 10 new Earth observation satellites on October 28th. Nine of the 10 payloads were super doves, basically shoebox size subsets built by San Francisco based imaging company Planet, which operates the world's largest Earth observation constellations. The 10th payload was CSAT 11B, a 78.3 pound microsatellite built by Japanese Canon Electronics. This is a demonstration craft that features a middle-sized telescope equipped with an ultra-high sensitivity camera to take night images of the Earth and small size telescopes, which are suitable for subset use. All 10 are bound for the Sun Synchronous Orbit, AKA SSO. This is pretty intense. Hundreds of activists gathered outside SpaceX's headquarters in Hawthorne, California on October 29th to protest an upcoming launch for the Turkish government. Their goal was to stop the rocket company from launching Turkey's Turksat 5A communication satellite. This is expected to launch on November 30th. The protesters gathered holding Armenian national flags and signs stating that the Turkish satellites will be used to kill civilians and target Armenians with UAVs. SpaceX did not respond. And then Halloween happened, which brings us to our final and most important segment of this show. I wanna talk about a dear friend of mine and the CFO of Back to Space, Dave Carey. Dave Carey was one of the biggest supporters of our mission and he worked tirelessly to make every crazy dream we had possible. It was actually his idea to start this, this YouTube channel and he was very excited. He was always one of the first people to comment. Dave Carey was doing what he loved the most, which was riding his bicycle on a Saturday afternoon when he was hit by a car. And he unfortunately did not make it, leaving his wife and his kids, which were extraordinarily close to him. I think this has hit me as well as the rest of the team in a way that I don't think words can fully describe, but I just want you guys all to know that everything that you've seen here on this channel, as well as all the independent work we're doing outside of this, was largely made possible because of Dave Carey. So um, think about Dave today, that would be great. And uh, yeah, thank you Dave for everything that you did.